Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Peter Kwasniewski, and this is a live show. I don't usually go live, so I'm just going to pull up my comments here. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching the show, give me a little thumbs up or a like or a yes in the comments. Let me know that everything's coming through clearly. It should be. In any case, Dr. K, thanks for coming back on the show. Oh, you're very welcome. It's always a pleasure to talk. You'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. K is now joining the official podcaster club. He's got his microphone and his headphones. So uh, there you go. It's working great. Today, we're going to be talking about this. Well, this, the springboard for the conversation is this book. We're going to talk about what's in the book. It's called Ultramontanism in Tradition. And the role, the subtitle is The Role of Papal... Oh, sorry. I got something oh. coming in my background here. There you go. My my uh, The stream was playing in my background of my headphones, and it sounds good, so we're fine. Uh, sorry, this book is uh, about the limits of papal authority, the role of papal authority in the Catholic faith. And uh, there are about 26 authors, arguments for and against various different positions on the papacy, a question that seems more and more relevant every day. So before we get into sort of the contents of the book, Dr. K, why don't you let us know why this book, why now, and why this format? Yes. Well, I mean, as you already, as you already intimated, um, there is a huge, a huge discussion going on right now. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Just okay. Um, there's there's an enormous discussion going on right now, uh, thanks to the past eleven years. But really, it's a discussion that goes back to Vatican II, to Vatican I. Uh, all the way back to the Council of Trent. In, in fact, the question of the papacy, when you read church history, is always there on the stage somewhere, whether it's a, a, a principal character or a secondary character, it's always there. And it's, of course, a huge question in the East-West uh, Orthodox Catholic disputes and dialogue, too. So understanding what is the papacy, what is the role of it, what are the limits inherent to it by divine law, by natural law, by canon law, um, understanding some of the intricate um, uh, disputed points between those who who press a maximalism, right? The Pope is, is, is an absolute monarch whose will is law, who is always to be obeyed, etc. And a kind of papal minimalism of the sort that you see in somebody like John Henry Newman, um, who, of course, was a devout Catholic, fully accepted the papacy, but he thought that the papal claims should be taken at their minimum, not at their maximum, right? And so I think you you just see here there's a fruitful area for discussion, but also a fruitful area for uh, controversy, uh, for name calling, you know, you're not a good Catholic because you don't hold this maximalist position, you know, or whatever the case might be. Um, and it becomes especially vexing, that is this whole topic, if you are living under a, a wayward or renegade pope, somebody who is acting, um, who is teaching either false doctrine or ambiguous doctrine, somebody who is seems to be or is upholding uh, immorality, um, somebody who is attacking the common good of the church uh, because of attacking the traditional liturgy. So when you have this kind of storm, uh, such as the one we're living in now, and again, it's not just of yesterday, but it's especially acute in the past decade, um, you know, then then uh, you're going to have even more debates about can a pope be a heretic? Um, who gets to decide that he's a heretic? If he is a heretic, what can you do about it? And so on and so forth. And there's so many questions uh, that open up. And what I decided is that it was time to bring together the very best writing on this subject um, by people like, I mean, I think you're, you're your viewers, our viewers, will have heard of a lot of these people, obviously Cardinal Burke and Bishop Schneider, mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, Charles Coulomb, Roberto de Mattei, Edward Fazer, Timothy Flanders, uh, Matt Gaspers, um, uh, John Lamont, Sebastian Morello, Martin Mosebach, Thomas Pink, Eric Sammons, Joseph Shaw, Henry Sear. You know, these are these are these are well known names, people who have been writing for a long time about these matters. Um, so I bring them all together. And as you say, it's it's a book that presents a lot of different perspectives. Yeah, yeah I want to make a comment about why I enjoyed, uh, before we get into the meat and potato of the uh, issue at hand, I want to I want to make a comment why I enjoyed the format so much. And I did. Now, I had read a few of these essays because some of them are from other places and then they're compiled in here. So I had read a few online before. So, But including the ones that I had read online and the ones in here, I can actually promise you that I read every page of the book. And um, 
I really enjoyed this form of, let's call it debate. Some, not, not all of it is, but there are some sort of back and forths in it. I'm writing my modernism book right now. And uh, one of the things that's been kind of bugging me for a while is that there is this insistence on uh, debate almost as something like professional wrestling today in academia where, and you see this with Catholics, you know, they're going to debate a Protestant again and again and again. And the thing that I find annoying about it is that in those formats, what you have is a false position that a position that we need to, that we must believe is false. Let's say Lutheranism or something and a Catholic position presented as if they're fighting as equals, which is not correct. That's not the Catholic tradition of the debate. The Catholic tradition of debate is what you find in this book, which is there is a disputed question amongst Orthodox theologians, and we're going to have representatives of the different persuasions within that school of thought, and we're going to have them hash out the details which are very important when all is considered. So I just want to, as before we get into the, the various limits of papal authority, what the scope is, etc., I actually think people will love reading this as a refreshing form of Catholic intellectual discourse, which is very rare to find today. Usually what you find today is, you know, Kennedy Hall is a schismatic. Someone called me like a CIA agent or something, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> Seriously, which I thought was hilarious because, I mean, I've always wanted to go in a helicopter or something. I never have. I'm also Canadian, so I don't even think I'm allowed to be if I want to. But anyway, so... Um, you know, but, or, you know, uh, you're a modernist or you're a traditionalist and those things may be true, but the point is it's, it's not really helpful. It's not refreshing. Whereas this was nice. So bravo to that. Now let's, let's define then because you brought up in your sort of opening discourse, there's these minimalist positions, maximalists. We talk about ultramontanism. I think the elephant in the room is this term ultramontanism, which for some people is a curse word. And for some people is, is, is a word of pious devotion. So what is ultramontanism and what is it not? Yes. So in this book, uh, there's a particular author, Jose Antonio Ureta, yeah. a member of, of TFP, Tradition, Family and Property. Um, he's a very eloquent writer. He's a, he's a, you know, he's, he's an academic. Um, he, he knows how to make an argument. Yes. I happen to disagree with him on a number of points, uh, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, but he takes the, he is very much the representative here of the old school ultramontanist position. He says, and he's right uh, about this, ultramontanism arose in the 19th century, mm -hmm as a response of devout and faithful and orthodox Catholics to the rise of liberalism. Yes. Liberalism both in the secular world, the anti-clerical Masonic world, and also liberalism within the church, which was, you know, as we know, liberalism and modernism, they grew up together, you know, from the cradle. Uh, we're talking about the 19th century here. And both of them really need to be understood as extrapolations of Protestant principles. So the, the Protestant revolt doesn't just explode in the 16th century, it continues to have ramifications as, as all of its principles unfold over time. And then you finally end up with phenomena like modernism and liberalism, uh, complicated genealogies, but they're all related to each other. All of the, all of the bad isms are like cousins to each other. You know, if I could put it that way, um, you could throw communism in there as well. So, or Marxism, you know, in that form. Uh, so, so Jose Oreta points out the ultramontanes, they were rallying to the Pope against this evil empire uh, of of liberalism and uh, incipient modernism um, and they they and the reason they wanted to rally behind the pope and the pope at the time was pius the ninth pio nono uh, is that you know he himself had begun as something of a liberal at yep. least sympathetic to that current uh, and then he became more and more adamantly anti-liberal as time went on so that by the time you reach the first Vatican Council, he is the principal bulwark against these errors in the Catholic world. And so naturally, um, both because of their devotion to him personally and because of, of this, I would say, Bellarminian view that the Pope is protected by a special charism from God. He's protected from error, he will never fall into, into heresy, that kind of extreme error against the faith. Um, and, you know, he will at least govern in a way that's compatible with the good of the church, you know, maybe not the best, but he'll, he'll be guided by the Holy Spirit in this manner. Um, and in a way, I guess, uh, somebody like Jose Ureta would say, this is a proper and pious and healthy attitude to have towards the Pope. Um, and it's, you know, it's only with extreme regret 
and remorse that we should ever have to criticize a pope. Um, you know, if, if we are criticizing a pope, and if there's something really worth criticizing, then we're in a disastrous situation because this is clearly an abuse of the papacy, not how it's supposed to be done. So basically, he's he's in favor of a very powerful pope, as long as the pope is good and orthodox, right? <laughs> um, and he and he dislikes the fact that there are traditionalists who are who who think that papal centralization has gone too far, and that there needs to be a sort of decentralization that bishops need to have more authority or need to be acknowledged as having more authority as ruling by divine right and not merely as vicars of the pope um and he you know the idea of of sort of decentralization and local pluralism un rightly understood i think that there are traditionalists who are very sympathetic to that kind of point of view uh, and you get some of the arguments for why in this book right and I, as a woman would be one of them yeah, let me yeah and let me jump in here before we go to maybe the negative side of how ultramontanism is viewed by people um, let's, let's give a little sketch here for those who might be not so well aware of the types of popes that we had for about 200 years. Now there's a revisionist history. We can, we are all made, we were all uh, born with original sin. Great saints have to go to confession. You were, if you're not the Virgin Mary or you're not regenerated in your mother's womb, like John the Baptist or something, you're probably going to lose your temper, you know? So there are certain things that uh, we can say about Pius X, the 11th, uh, Leo the 13th, Pius the 12th, uh, the Gregories of the 1800s, the other Piuses of the 1800s. We can find things where we'd say, well, you know, maybe that wasn't the best decision. Pius the fifth, you know, uh, I wrote about this in an article on my Substack. you know, his decision to forbid Catholics in England uh, to give any obedience, even in a legal sense, to the queen uh, was probably a really bad decision, and it wasn't really even continued for after about 10 years after he died. Uh, you can read about that in Edmund Campion's biography. So, But he was an incredible pope. I mean, Pius V, this is the pope of Coprimum and the, the catechism of, of Pius V and Lepanto. I mean, talk about a storied pope. But point being, for these, in this time period of let's call it the post-Reformation time period, at least on paper, at least with documents, at least with theology, encyclicals, and so forth, we had these lions in Rome that were putting out document after document. You know, I'm reading through a bunch of uh, stuff on the kingship of Christ right now from Father Fahey and so forth. And it's basically just, it's like all footnotes. It's all it's all citations of Leo the Thirteenth and Pius Eleventh. Both of those are men who are probably won't be canonized in the traditional sense. They won't be canonized by the modernists for sure, but in a, even traditional Catholics would say maybe Leo XIII shouldn't be canonized, but their documents were unbelievable. So it makes perfect sense that you can look to these men and look to this large corpus and say, if we just had the old-timey papacy, things would turn out just fine. And in a limited sense, they might, but there's a danger in this persuasion which isn't, it's not really a doctrine. We're not, it isn't, we're not talking about something de fide here. We're talking about something working out. So what's the danger to this ultramontanism and how do you think we see it today really since, yes. since the last 50, 60 years? Yes, exactly. And, and your last point is a very apt one. Uh, ultramontanism is not a doctrine. It's an attitude. It's yeah. a mentality. Uh, it's a, it's a certain spirit. Um, and one of the, one of the most valuable pieces in this book, uh, it has so many valuable pieces, as you know, from reading it, but, um, but it, there's a, there's a, there's a long essay in here called the false spirit of Vatican one by Flanders. Timothy Flanders. Um, and or he it actually it's what is the false spirit of Vatican one that's chapter thirty two, um, he he very patiently lays out you know here are the elements that were actually defined at the first Vatican Council, and then here are all of the extrapolations that people have made from them which were never defined never formulated, never enforced uh, officially but which were taken for granted mm -hmm. and almost. Um, subsumed into the council. And so it, it is actually true to say there was a spirit of Vatican I, just as there was a spirit of Vatican II. The spirit of Vatican II was much, much worse. Granted, yeah. that nobody argues about that if, if he has any clue. But there was a penumbra or a kind of atmosphere around that first council. Uh, and and what, what's the problem with it? That's your question. Um, <clears throat> I think it has a number of problems. When you treat the Pope as an absolute monarch, or when he perceives himself to be that way, um, pretty quickly, what will happen is that he will emulate what happens in absolute nation states uh, in this development that took place over the last few centuries, where um, suddenly all of the local and regional customs, 
are, um, if not abolished, at least they are subordinated to a national code of law. So now we have one code of law, uh, and that's what happened to the Catholic Church, a Napoleonic style code of canon law, which had never existed before until Pius X. Um, you know, and, and then all of these different regional customs for selecting bishops, sometimes by the canons of a cathedral. Um, and if you go back far enough by popular acclaim, I'm not saying that would be a great idea right now, but uh, unless you, it was a community of traditionalists who, were, who got to be the, the ones picking the, the new bishop. Um, but you know, there were all sorts of ways in which bishops were chosen with the collaboration of the Holy See and in the 19th and 20th centuries, that was all obliterated in favor of centralized papal selection of every single bishop of the Latin Rite Church. That's unheard of historically. That never, ever, ever, ever happened, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what happens then in this kind of a top-down system? All of the bishops are very likely to see themselves, or at least they could be, they could, they could float into seeing themselves as branch managers of Vatican Inc., right? Um, they've all been put there by the Pope. He could call, he can hire and fire them at will, which is what we're seeing <laughs> happening. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then they stop, in a way, they stop having the motivation to rule and teach and, and guide their flocks because they can just assume that that the big man in Rome is going to take care of everything. He's going to write the encyclicals. Mm -hmm. He's going to issue the laws, you know, and, and they can, in a sense, they can become passive. The bishops can become passive. And similarly, the faithful can become passive and start to think the Catholic faith is not something I need to learn and study and embrace and internalize and live myself so much as something I just need to be told what to do by other people. So you, you become a bit of an automaton and you start to give up that sense of ownership of possession of the Catholic faith. We, every baptized man and woman and child possesses the Catholic faith as his or her greatest treasure. And it's not something that is, so to speak, given to us externally with all kinds of conditions of blind obedience. It's given to us internally through baptism and through the sacraments and through authentic catechesis. Um, and we have a duty and a responsibility and a privilege to be actively living and speaking on behalf of and defending this faith. That's what confirmation does for us. Um, so I think I just I'll just say this last thing. It seems to me that when you have this kind of excessive centralization, it has this ripple effect of making a lot of the lower levels more passive and and they start to prize this idea of blind obedience as as if it were the greatest virtue. And that I think is is very, very harmful. Okay, so that's good. Let's break this down to let's let's break this down to basic understandings of like virtue and concepts of how of categories of of the scope in which things exist so in the comments you know i'm seeing certain comments like well the pope does have ultimate absolute authority according to vatican one let's just grant let's just let's even just for the sake of it let's just grant the maximal position even if we grant the maximal position the pope is still someone who exists in the realm of the created order the pope mm -hmm. is still a human being uh, the papacy is not a sacrament. Uh, he's a bishop. There are debates about sort of an elevation, maybe in his character the, of, of holy orders. That's whatever. But that's not teaching of the church. It's just, These are disputes. He is a man who is in a position in an office that has the authority and the, and the, the pope, the, pap the church, by extension, and the pope as, part, uh, as the head of the church, the vicar of Christ. They, the pope does have authority over the entirety of the spiritual realities of the world he is the spiritual authority on earth and indirectly he has authority over certain temporal affairs as well when they touch on the spiritual this is this is kingship of christ 101 so he is the authority and the temporal authority must subject itself uh in the appropriate manner to the spiritual authority um and and all of that is true all of that is true but the pope still doesn't have the ability to say two plus two is five the pope still doesn't have the ability to say um, me, I'm going to kick out this bishop uh, because it will be good for this diocese. He doesn't have the power or authority to make that good for the diocese if it's not good for the diocese. So where where are the limits? Even though the Pope is, yes. you know, Michael Davies, Michael Davies was famous in that uh, debate with um, E. Michael Jones. And he said, yes, the Pope has absolute authority, but it can't be arbitrary. Not because mm -hmm. he didn't believe the Pope didn't have the power, but because... Uh, we're we're getting into the realm of absurdity where he becomes like uh, Muhammad or Allah, where he has this voluntarist will that can change the the nature of reality at will. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that a better way of putting it is not that the Pope has absolute authority, but that he has supreme authority. Okay, supreme yeah. means that that there's no one above the Pope concerning all of the things that pertain to the Pope. But not well, everything but, pertains to the Pope. This is right. the point you're making, right? right. The uh, the matters matters of faith and morals do not they're not subject, they're not malleable by the Pope. They're not subject to his authority. That would be voluntarism. He can't say that something which uh, isn't the Roman rite in terms of its historical content, its its customary uh, and immemorial and venerable content is the Roman rite. That's nominalism, right? That would That's like saying black yeah. is white. You, he doesn't have the authority to do that. Uh, I'm not saying incidentally that he doesn't have the authority to institute any kind of new liturgical rite. I'm just saying if there's an existing thing, he can't say that it's something other than what it is. He can't say that's something, something that's not something is thing. something else. It's just, it's basic. Right. Yeah, he's, he's not magical. But um, but then I think we can be even more precise about that and say the Pope is subject to divine law in his own behavior and in his teaching. He's subject to natural law. That means he must rule for the common good. If he doesn't rule for the common good, and there are ways in which you can see that he's not ruling for the common good, all you have to do is study church history, um, that he that there are things he can he can command which are invalid or illicit um, if he's if he's acting against the common good. Um, and this is why we have a long tradition. And one of the reasons why I consider this book so incredibly valuable is because it authors like Thomas Pink really, who really know the sources of the past centuries of the church, unlike most people on the internet who just say, oh, the Pope has absolute authority. That's what Vatican I says. Um, they show how long of a tradition there is in the church yeah. of theologians and canonists uh, like like Hostiensis, Cardinal Burke talks about him, like John of St. Thomas, yeah. like uh, uh, Torquemada, Juan Torquemada, Ca Cardinal Cajetan, uh, Francisco Suarez. I mean, there, there are many outstanding theologians and canonists who talk uh, at length about all the things the Pope cannot do, including overturn all of the ecclesiastical traditions that concern the, the liturgical rites and sacraments. That's just not something the Pope can do. And this is why uh, John Henry Newman said the church has never abolished any of her traditional rights. And Joseph Ratzinger quoted him as yeah, saying that. That's amazing. And then, <laughs> and then, and then went, went on to say in Sumorum Pontificum, he, he, where, where in, in Sumorum, Sumorum Pontificum, we get the dogmatic fact of that document, which is what was sacred yeah. in the past remains sacred and great today and cannot be, uh, outlawed or cannot be forbidden or considered even considered harmful, right? That statement is a statement of universal truth that governs all popes, just the way that the sun, moon, and the stars govern the popes, and he can't change them either, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think I think that there is, uh, this book is a really good resource for people who are either confused about these questions or who are tempted to be hyperpapalists. Um, because I think the term hyperpapalism is actually better than ultramontanism. Ultramontanism I agree. Is, is a loaded historical term. It's a very complicated term because it's it's both a set of propositions and also an attitude, a mentality. Uh, it's kind of vague. Um, but hyperpapalism is very much what we're seeing nowadays, uh, you know, on the internet with people who just bark at you as if, you know, you, you have to instantly submit um, you know, with a kind of Islamic submission to whatever the Pope says on, fa on, on, any, on any topic under the sun. And really where this goes, where this mentality goes is right into Sedevacantism. So if, if, if people want to be Sedevacantists, I can't argue with them. I'm not, I mean, I could, I can try to argue with them, but, um, but uh, it, if you really, if you, if you really believe that the Pope will never, it's not possible for the Pope to teach any error uh, in faith and morals, and I'm talking about by the ordinary papal magisterium, obviously not an ex cathedra decision. If you don't think it's possible for him to to issue a disciplinary um, policy or decree that is harmful to the common good of the church, I know there are scholastics who hold this, but there are also others who argue against it. Yeah. Um, if you if you really think this way, I would like to help to disabuse you of, of these erroneous perceptions um, because you are either already a state of a contest or you're on your way to becoming one if that's the way you think about the papacy. There's a lot of things I'm going to say to that because it just made me spark a, a bunch of ideas. So I was reading an article today. So two things. One, you're right about arguing with state of a contest. And my viewers know 
I'm not throwing rocks at you, say days, if that's your thing. I don't agree. I know you have your reasons, but there's a lot of reasons why I don't agree with it. And I suggest you get this book. Uh, and especially, that's why I was looking for this essay here. Uh, it's by a friar of the Order of Preachers, Anonymous, because he does a very, very, very good job of showing that, uh, you know, there is there is not a unanimity of, a, there is not a... There is not a moral unanimity about what to do with a heretical pope in a way that's kind of stamped it, locked it. But there are some pretty strong arguments that uh, a pope could be a heretic, and it's it's kind of a complicated question. And it makes sense that he would have stayed anonymous because of the, the subject matter and the times in which we live. Um, and also, John Lamont's essay, uh, Pope Francis is Public Heretic, he, you know, his conclusion was essentially, yes, if you are a heretic, and he believes Pope Francis is a heretic and shows why, I believe the new document from Tucho Fernandez has heresy in it. Um, I don't know how it doesn't have heresy to say man is in, has infinite dignity because of the fact that he exists. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. You, you wrote about that. I talked about it. I think it's problematic. Um, nonetheless, so he proves that he thinks Pope Francis is a heretic and that a heretic uh, ceases to be Catholic. But at the same time, there's a moral unanimity that there is no way to really depose the Pope and what to do. So it's a, it's a question that's much more complicated than a black and white answer. So I do recommend say is that you do pick up this book because there are a variety of opinions that I think will be useful to you. I think it'll be useful. Um, and it, there's a theologian in the society, St. Pius X, Father Glaze. He's kind of like one of the uh, more well-known, him and Father Calderon. Uh, they're kind of the two big minds. They usually are the ones that go to Rome and talk about things when they have discussions. And uh, he helps form the seminarians in Acon and one of our priests or a couple of our, actually all three of my priests at my chapel right now did go to Acon, but one of them he was saying, you know, Father Glaze told us, if you ever find yourself at dinner uh, with Sede Vacantis and they start to debate you, he says, you just close your mouth and you start cutting your food and you sit there and you eat your food because it's impossible because there's this circular reasoning that comes through it. And the reasoning is, is because you touch on this idea that um, some believe that it's impossible for the Pope to ever uh, require anything disciplinary that would be even, even anything disciplinary that would be false. Because they'll say, well, there's an aspect of teaching in the disciplinary matters of the Pope. Because, you know, he's saying do this for this reason. Well, there's a moral uh, a part of it. So really, if that's the case, then everything the Pope's ever going to do or say in any legal or, or teaching capacity must be completely infallible. Nonetheless, when we, when we look through church history, we do find contradictions between popes. We just see it. We just see contradictions between popes. And it didn't just start in 1958. Didn't, it didn't just start then. And you do a great job of showing that um, in your book here. So I just, you know, I want to give Sede's a, a little bit of encouragement. Go get this book and wrestle with it because I've read a lot of Sede of Contest literature. And I think if you keep your purview to about a 300 year period, if you kind of go in this post Reformation to early part of the last century period, kind of end with Father Below, theologians like that, and you just kind of stick there. I think you're going to have a pretty strong state of a contest argument. But then I think if you go back past Bellarmine and you look at this question disputed in different ages of the church, I think you find some holes in those arguments. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, jump in. I'm wondering if I can, yeah, jump in for a moment. Um, because, you know, Bellarmine's position, uh, it, it's, really, it's really astonishing to me the extent to which people, maybe without realizing it, they, they infallibilize Bellarmine as if the fact that he believed that he had a theological opinion that a pope couldn't fall into heresy makes it necessarily true. I mean, that, that's that's quite absurd on the face of it. He's a doctor of the church, but so is St. Thomas Aquinas. In fact, Aquinas was a greater doctor of the church, and Aquinas committed errors as well. For example, he didn't he didn't accept the Immaculate Conception. Yeah. He 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 made he argued against it, and later on his arguments were overturned, right? Yeah. Um, so Bellarmine's position on this question of papal heresy was discussed by B Bishop Vincent Gasser in his official relatio. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to mention this, it's on page, page 87, pages 87 to 88. Um, Gosser, we all know that this relatio by Gosser is, is an authoritative commentary yes. on Pastor Eternus, and it was intended to be the official commentary on it. So it's very authoritative. Um, he says, Gosser says, as far as the doctrine set forth in the draft, Pastor Eternus goes, the deputation is unjustly accused of wanting to raise an extreme opinion 
namely that of Albert Pigius, yes. to the dignity of a dogma. For the opinion of Pigius, which Bellarmine indeed calls pious and probable, was that the Pope as an individual person or a private teacher was able to err from a type of ignorance, but was never able to fall into heresy or teach heresy. This is clear from the very words of Bellarmine, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Before I end this general relatio, I should respond to the most grave objection that has been made from this podium, namely that we wish to make the extreme opinion of a certain school of theology a dogma of Catholic faith. Indeed, this is a very grave objection. And when I heard it from the mouth of an outstanding and most esteemed speaker, I hung my head sadly and pondered well before speaking. Good God, have you so confused our minds and our tongues that we are misrepresented as promoting the elevation of the extreme opinion of a certain school of theology to the dignity of dogma? Yeah. I mean, I mean how could he have spoken any clearer, any more clearly about this? What, what that shows you, the relatio in general, and also in a very particular way, the letter that the German bishops wrote after Vatican I, mm -hmm. responding to Bismarck's attack, uh, and then Pius the Ninth's letter in which he endorsed the German bishop's letter. When you look at all of those documents together, what you see is, yes, Vatican I teaches very strongly uh, papal supremacy, papal primacy, uh, but it teaches in a, in a laser-like way about these particular points, and it leaves open a number of disputed questions, the, ex exactly the kind of disputed questions that you and I are talking about and that this book talks about. And it's very important for Catholics, I think, to be able to be comfortable with a certain amount of uncertainty and a certain amount of debate and discussion about these issues. That's always been the way it has been in, Catholic, in, the, in the church. And I feel as if modern people, they want every single thing nailed down. They want a clear, concise, irrefutable answer to every possible question that they might have about the Catholic faith. And I'm sorry to say this, I hope it doesn't disappoint you, but there are, there are still disputed and debated questions, and there always will be until the second coming of Christ, right? And until the beatific vision, then you'll have no disputed questions. Yeah, that's one thing I say in my, uh, my SSPX book. You know, I say, listen, I mean, I can answer, or there are answers to... I think every question someone's going to throw forward, but it's like people are going to find new objections and you're going to say, well, now I have to wrestle with that, you know, and this is what Protestants do against the Catholic faith. I mean, how are there still Calvinists? It's, it's astonishing to me. I mean, it's like you should read St. Francis de Sales and it's just done, but somebody comes up with something new. So then you got to figure it out and it is what it is. I mean, you know, we're, we're not, maybe we have infinite dignity according to the Luna document, but we don't have infinite intellects at least. <laughs> yes, um, that's okay, funny. we're at the halfway point now. Uh, we should do some shameless promotions here. So we've got your book. It's right here, ladies and gentlemen. I put it in the uh, description area. I just added it live. So if it's not there, just refresh. You'll see it. It's also in the chat box for the live chat. You can buy that book from Os Juicy Press, uh, which is quickly becoming one of my favorite presses. And uh, you, Dr. K., are going on some pilgrimages that you might want to talk about before I plug my own? Oh, sure. Yeah. In October, um, middle, middle of October, I'm going to Greece and Turkey, basically in the footsteps of St. Paul. So going to all of the famous sites, uh, both pagan and Christian in Greece and Turkey. Um, we're going to have a TLM chaplain every day, traditional Latin mass. Mm. Um, it'll be wonderful. It's going to be fantastic and very much focused on the pilgrimage and the meaning of what we're seeing and doing there. Um, and then in February, uh, I'm going to be going to Sicily, also with the TLM pilgrimage. Uh, that has not yet been announced officially, so you can't find any information about it. But the Greece and Turkey tour you can find by going to St. Charles Pilgrimages. Okay. Just, uh, I, I think I can I can give you the link to that. Well, why don't you, you just to... tell me real quick, where uh, you have a personal website, right? Yes, it's it's peterkorzhnevsky.com. Okay, I'll put that but, in, the, uh, in the show I, notes. I, yeah, but the, the main place people can read me is uh, Tradition and Sanity. Oh, that's right. Stack. So, so tradition and sanity on something. I'll put that right there as well. Um, and sanity substack. And people just look those things up and you can just contact Dr. K somehow there and it's no big deal. Okay, um, good. I got to do a shameless plug for a couple things quickly. Uh, are you a GK Chesterton fan, Dr. K? 
Absolutely. Yes. Orthodoxy is one of the best books. <laughs> well, there. I'm doing a talk on orthodoxy at the 150th birthday conference of GK Chesterton in London, England. And um, it's presented by Corner Cabinet Magazine, which is a uh, British uh, sort of wide ranging Catholic periodical. It's a new magazine and, and they're launching this thing and it's really exciting. You can see this. It's on the 1st of June this year. So you, you can tell how British they are because it's Saturday, 1st June, which is a very British yes. way of doing things. Um, it's going to be at Cavendish Square, June 1st. The address is there. Uh, obviously, this isn't going to work unless you want to take a flight, my American friends. But if you want to, go for it. Uh, I'll be speaking. Um, uh, Father Sherry, who is the District Superior of the Society in the UK and Ireland, will be speaking. And he used to be our uh, prior and our district superior, and he is an excellent orator. He's a hilarious uh, speaker and very, very articulate, and just can talk for an hour and a half off the top of his, off the off the dome, as they say, without making any errors and with making the crowd laugh and things. He'll be wonderful. He's going to be talking about everlasting man, I believe. There'll be some other experts there talking about the life of Chesterton. So if you're a Chestertonian, GK is turning 150 years old, and we're going to be there to celebrate his birthday. Um, and uh, I've heard the beer is good in England, so I wouldn't mind sharing some. But with those of you who show up, last thing. I also am going on a pilgrimage. It's not at the same time as Dr. K, so you can come on all of them. You can go to England. You can go with him in October. And then you can come with me uh, in uh, in uh, November. And here's a quick promo for that that I'll just play for you. All the trouble in Rome, it is easy to forget about one unshakable fact. Our church is the Roman Catholic Church, and Rome is the Eternal City. What a perfect time to go on a pilgrimage to the Eternal City and the other monumental sites of Catholic heritage in beautiful Italy. Join Father Albert Calio and me this November as we tour through the shrines of Italy and the Amalfi Coast as we attend daily Mass in the Old Rite in the footsteps of St. Peter and St. Francis. Click the link in the description to register for this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to discover the heart of the Catholic faith in the heart of the old Roman Empire. KennedyHall.ca slash Italy, KennedyHall.ca slash Italy, or the link for it is directly under this show uh, in the podcast area. Okay, I want to switch gears here, Dr. K. Um, one really fascinating, a couple of really fascinating essays, but one of the more fascinating things I found was from Dr. or is it Dr. Ch is it is he Dr. Chessman or just Stuart? I'm not uh, sure. He's Stuart Chessman. Yeah, okay, good. I'm not a doctor either, so we're good company. But um, he he talked about sort of the psychological effects of this or, or e either the effects or the roots. It's kind of a chicken or the egg kind of thing. Do we have ultramontanism because we have cult of personality already? Do we have cult of personality because we have ultramontanism? Kind of where does this begin? And he gave some really interesting insight into how we've seen this ultramontanist or let's call it hyper papalist because ultramontanism understood in its right context is a good thing, but in the, in the sort of negative sense, this hyper papalist, let's say, cult of personality of the Pope thing, we've seen this in the church kind of in general. So we have all these movements. You know, he talks about Opus Dei. He talks about the Catholic worker with Dorothy Day. He talks about the various charismatic renewals, the distributist communes. Uh, I'm not aware of all these in depth, uh, so I'm just going off what he said. But I've really seen this. I mean, we, we live in an age of, like, celebrity priests. It's very strange, you know. Um, it's a very strange thing. Not that there aren't priests that are known for being holy and this kind of thing, but we live in this age where Catholic clerics and things like that, you know, um, they become like leaders of movements. They become like leaders of clubs. And that doesn't really seem the way things have been done in the past in the church. Yes, we've had orders, you know, we've had, uh, but these are very rare and they're usually accompanied by some very astonishing things. You know, we have St. Francis of Assisi, sure, uh, but that, you know, that's not the same thing as someone popping up and saying, look, I just had visions or something like that. So do you want to comment on this kind of, I guess, the psychological effects or roots of where we are today with this ultramontanism cult personality thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is a complicated question in terms of where it comes from. But what Stuart Chessman, he just illustrates as a fact that where there's energy or enthusiasm or interest of any kind in the modern Catholic Church, it's almost always connected with one of these movements, you know, and with their charismatic personalities. And he, he you know, I think there, there are one reason for that, at least, is that um, 
Okay, let me just give you a, a yeah. gigantic claim. I think one of the effects of modernity, because of liberalism, because of, of statism, um, I think that human beings have become more and more isolated from each other, more and more atomized. Uh, you know, the, the process right now, there used to be a, a rich structure of subsidiarity that that could be found in anybody's life in the middle ages right you belonged to a local community you had your extended family that you lived among you belonged to the local parish community you were probably looked looked after by the the local aristocrat you know who was in charge of of these this domain you know and there was a king that you could look at as a father um there was there was such a rich and then of course there were guilds for the trades so yeah. there was such a rich social life that nobody felt alone and isolated like some kind of atom and nowadays it's kind of like the state the absolute bureaucratic faceless state and the individual taxpayer you know and that's it there's like what happened yeah. to all these intermediate societies and there have been whole books written about this you know people don't go out bowling anymore they don't go out to the to the dance club i mean i'm talking about the old-fashioned dance dances yeah. you know yeah. they, they there are so where people are feeling alone and they they want to have a deep and fulfilling experience of community. And that's where these movements come in, right? Yeah. And that's where the need for a charismatic, inspiring leader comes in to whom you can have this kind of cult of personality. You can look up to him, oh, he's our father, he's our master, he's our leader, right? Um, and I'm sorry to say it, but this is very dangerous for fallen human beings. It really is. Um, and it's, it's uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and as Stuart Chessman points out, many, many of these movements have ended up in retrospect being discovered to have had problems with their with their founders and leaders, right? Either financial scandals or sexual scandals or whatever it might be, right? Yeah, I'm going to read a passage. I just, I just found it. Um, it's on page 446. If you're following at home with your copy, um, and it's by Stuart Chessman, and the essay. I really like the way he writes. I've never met him before, but I was really impressed with his work. Um, Anyway, uh, the essay is called The Culture of Totalitarian Ultramontanism. That's the title right there. So he says, the novel Catholic institution of the movement emerged. And he's talking about this sort of pre-Vatican uh, I era, starting even before the Second World War, despite their bewildering diversity and membership requirements, organization, and objectives. He said, compare two early examples, Opus Dei and the Catholic Worker. The movements all rested on similar foundations. This is the kicker. Irrational loyalty and absolute obedience to a quote-unquote visionary founder. Also, also included is a degree of separation from mainstream Catholic life, formulas for addressing alleged economic and spiritual failures of the church, and usually a blurring of the traditional roles of clergy and laity. That was an astounding observation on his part. That's what you see everywhere. Often the movement would establish a direct relationship with the Vatican. What had been a fringe phenomenon before Vatican II subsequently acquired a growing influence over the church, especially under Pope John Paul II. The number of movements grew even though their absolute membership remained small. They departed from or even challenged the ordinary Catholic life of the clergy and laity, yet reinforced both the centralized absolute papacy and Vatican II. For example... Uh, devotion and obedience to a charismatic leader having absolute authority, an emotional and irrational culture, and often arbitrary liturgical and devotional practices. Pope Francis generally has not shared Pope John Paul II's enthusiasm for the movements, which is true, except for certain communities aligned with his objectives, like Santa Digio, uh, or at least until recently the neocatechumenal way. But the Pope's leadership style, with its accompanying cult of personality, is very much like that of a movement founder. This is one of the greatest pieces... This is one of the greatest couple paragraphs you'll ever read on this topic. This is something that we see in spades in the church. The blurring of the lines between the laity and the clerics. You see this in all types of movements in the church. Um, you know, people like to throw around when um, Fulton Sheen said that there'll be a time of the laity. I don't think he meant it as a positive. It's not a good thing that we are supposed to be in quote unquote roles where we're in charge. Uh, that's disorder. Um, also, if you look around the church today, everyone is looking for their visionary, whether it's weird apparition movements, whether it's mystics, uh, whether it's, and, and listen, God bless Strickland and Burke and Schneider. 
these men will be the first to tell you, I am not your guru. And Archbishop Lefebvre used to say this. He would say, I'm not the leader of a movement. I'm not leader of a movement. Um, but in our church today, we're always looking for this. Do you think that this, I mean, could, could we say that Pope Francis is kind of like, uh, he's like, it's it's like a mutant, you know, it's like the, the culmination of all of the different experiments and he's the the archetype of this combination of ultra uh, ultramontine hyperpapalism movement visionary founder cult like obedience etc does he kind of represent the culmination of all that yes he he does in fact and you can see that if you look at his um as sort of the papal hagiographers like austin ivory uh, Massimo Fagioli, Mike Lewis, you look at these people and they they have a cult-like attachment to Pope Francis. For example, if he says, <clears throat> you know, contrary to the witness of, of sacred scripture, contrary to the unanimous witness of sacred tradition, contrary to all of the teaching of, of the councils and the popes preceding me, I now tell you uh, that the death penalty is intrinsically evil um it's 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 and 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 actually there is at least that heresy in dignitas infinita that it says in one sentence that the death penalty is always uh it always violates the dignity of the human person or something something of that sort i don't, I don't remember the exact phraseology but it's yeah. it's much stronger than just it's a prudential judgment you know that we shouldn't do it now because of x y and z it's no this is wrong it's against human dignity period um full stop right yeah uh and and so you know well no it doesn't matter whether what francis teaches is in accord with what has come before it doesn't matter. Yeah. He is the anointed one of God. He is the Catholic Joseph Smith, so to speak. Um, <laughs> and and uh, for those who know, don't, sorry, and, for those who don't know, that's the Mormon founder. That's the founder of Mormonism. I mean, and, and this is not. This is this is no. I mean, it, it is a laughing matter, but it's not a laughing matter in the sense that that uh, you know the the Mormons people kind of make fun of them for for changing their policies on things because the leader, whoever the current leader is receives a message from God that things are now to be different than yeah. they were before. I mean, th this is this is classic cult like behavior. Yeah. Um, and it's it is so antithetical to the Catholic notion of the papacy. There's there's a wonderful essay in here. Uh, well, we all have our fa I mean, I have so many favorites in here, but one of them is by Sebastian Morello. Yeah, it's it's called Yes, Francis is the Pope and his office binds him. Um, and, you know, Morello elaborates a point that Martin Mosebach says very briefly in the third episode of Mass of the Ages, right? When he says, the Pope is of all rulers the most bound, yes. right? Not the, not the least bound, but the most bound, right? Um, that is a proper Catholic mentality. Anything other than that is not a Catholic mentality. It's some kind of weird, uh, you know, cult, cult like um, uh, absolutization of somebody who is simply the vicar of Christ, somebody who is the servant of the servants of God, as St. Gregory the Great said. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. The cult-like thing is huge. I mean, you see this where people who are in cult-like situations in their personal lives, whether it's work or some club mm -hmm. or, you know, some movement of some secular sort, uh, or, you know, they have, uh, let's say, a totalitarian outlook from a particular family member who's over who's lording over them, and when someone gets in a position like that, they're incapable of seeing the faults of their of their guru. They're incapable of seeing, they're incapable of thinking critically about the actions of their guru, and they will essentially twist reality to make reality fit to the perception of their guru. And yes, it's wrong. Yeah, and this is and this is what you see with with something like Maurice Dominique Philippe of the community of St. John, who, I mean, there were hundreds of people under the sway of his abusive authority. Yeah. You see it with with uh, with Father Rupnik. How is it that Father Rupnik yeah. uh, was able to convince 20 nuns or more to to do disgraceful sexual acts with him? How is that possible? It's because of the this hold of the personality. And in the case of the papacy, right, it, it's, it happens in a slightly different way, not by this um, immediate contact with a magnetic charismatic personality, but more because of a distortion, a profound distortion of the of the pious attitude of reverence and respect towards the Holy Father. I don't want anybody listening to misunderstand me that, I, of course, I believe we should have pietas, piety towards our fathers in Christ, beginning with any priest, any bishop, 
and the Pope. Obviously, we have this pietas towards them. They are our fathers, but they have to act as our fathers. And when they act as abusive fathers, we need to keep a certain distance from them. Right? This is something Roberto de Mattei says. You know, when 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 the father is 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 acting abusively, then you can still honor and respect him while keeping your distance yeah. and while being judiciously critical of that. Right? Jose Ureta, the most ultramontane of the authors in the book, I guess, along with Dimite, but Ureta was more forceful. Um, he even made an analogy when he was talking about, um, oh, who's the fellow who started TFP? It's not Silvera. Oliveira de Correa. Correa. I was, gonna, I was mixing up yeah. with Silvera. But um, he, he, he cited him who basically... Was all, he was obviously very ultramontane, and then after the council, when things went a little crazy, and he's involved with Campos, which was linked with the SSPX and things, so obviously these men had no problem resisting the abuses, but it was like, how do you, rec how do you reconcile these positions, is what people were asking him. He said, well, in Catholicism, we don't have divorce, but in times of abuse, we do have separation. You know, mm -hmm. I, th I thought that was an astonishing example, because so often, so often, and, and I will say this, when you truly love the papacy, you can see it properly. When you truly love the papacy, you can see it for what it is and not for what it isn't. If you truly love your father, you see him for who he's supposed to be, and you don't say, well, he's a drunk, so what's the issue? You say, no, I love him too much to just say, it's fine. He's a drunk. He shouldn't be drinking, you know? So um, I thought that was perfect because so often traditionalists, especially society supporters like myself, they'll be so worried. They're so worried about anyone thinking that there could be some sort of quote unquote separation because we think this necessarily means schism. But I think in a more like, let's say metaphysical level without getting into the legal technicalities, what he was trying to say there is, well, what else are you supposed to do when you're being abused? Mm -hmm. We don't have the answers for, I don't have the answers for you. I'm sure St. Athanasius did not have the answers when he was in the desert saying they have the churches, but we have the faith. I don't know what that means in canon law. Nobody knew what that meant, but it was this man is a heretic. I'm not supposed to be a heretic, so I can't go with the heretics. <laughs> so I'm just not going to do that right now. This father is abusive. He's beating mom. There's no such thing as divorce because sacraments don't break, but we've got to leave. And, 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 and this is our situation. And that's really where we find ourselves right now. And, and, and I, I, anyway, I was really astonished by that comment. I think it applies perfectly to our time. Yes, yes, exactly. And I mean, you, you also touched on earlier in your comments, um, two, two phrases that are often heard nowadays when we talk about when, when we try to analyze the situation. The first is the Stockholm syndrome. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's what you were describing where the, the one the, the prisoner or the abuse victim is eventually um, psychologically conformed to the uh the abuser and and begins to defend the abuser right you know uh you know like like when in famous examples where non-muslims were captured by muslims and then they convert to islam right things yeah. like that that's the classic stockholm syndrome situation and then the gaslighting phenomenon right where the abuser tells tells you it's your fault it's it's because of your faults your you know you traditionalists um, you know, if, if you if you didn't complain about papal documents and if you didn't complain about the Novus Ordo, then, you know, none of this bad stuff would be happening to you. Right. That's that's yeah. the kind of that's that's pure gaslighting. Right. Um, and we have to be able to recognize these psychological phenomena for what they are in order to yeah. avoid them. You know? All right. We've got a few minutes left uh, and there's some questions, Dr. K. I, I, I put a note in the uh, the live chat saying post your questions. I got a couple so far. So the fellow with the name, or lady, I don't know, because it's anonymous, Christianity is Catholicism, starts with a quote from Amos, shall two walk together except they be agreed? That's a good citation. And then, and then the question is, how can you be in communion with Bergoglio when he doesn't profess the fullness of the faith? It's a good question. So how yeah. can we say we're in communion with a heretic or someone who may be a heretic? What would you say to that? Yes. So I think there are a couple of levels to this question. The first is that, um, and, and some of the authors in this book do a really good job of explaining why, especially uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, um, we, we can have a, a certainty that Pope, we, we could on our own say, in my view, according to my knowledge, um, Pope Francis has taught heresy on X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, he seems to be at least a material heretic, somebody who objectively holds heresy. 
do I have the authority? Do I have the position to say to to judge that he is a formal heretic, and therefore that he has fallen from the from the chair of Saint Peter? There is no one in the history of the church who has ever thought that any individual Catholic, all by himself, had the authority or the competence to make such a judgment. That's a very serious judgment to say. I know for a fact that this holder of ecclesiastical office is a professed, stubborn, pertinacious, formal heretic, and therefore he has fallen from his office, his chair is empty. No one has ever defended that that I as a layman could make that judgment and, and live according to that judgment. That would be sinful. Right. In fact, if a priest stopped saying the name of Francis in the Roman canon, that would be sinful because he has no business making that decision for himself. Who could make the decision? It seems to me clear from from the the long the many centuries of discussion of this question that the ones who could make such a discussion are the bishops that is the bishops and especially the cardinals because the bishops share the role of governing the church with the pope the pope himself is a bishop he's the he's the prince he's the head of the bishops but all of the bishops are successors of the apostles therefore they have apostolic authority they could evaluate uh whether a pope was was formally heretical, and certainly the College of Cardinals, which exists in order to to elect uh, popes, um, could. I mean, Cajetan's argument is just as the College of Cardinals votes to say this man is now sitting in the throne of Peter, they could also vote, or they could also agree among themselves, this man can no longer sit in this chair. There's There has been a rupture between the man and the chair. Now we need to proceed to elect a new pope. I certainly believe that that can be done, that could be done. It, it's not going to be done for all kinds of <laughs> No, it's not going uh, to be done anytime but, but soon. But at least we're talking theologically about what could be done. That's what could be done. Yeah. We also have to remember that, that you know, when you read church history, you see a lot of very unsavory um, and very scandalous episodes where men who are clearly unfit to be governing, who are clearly ravaging the common good of the church, um, who probably should be removed uh, for, for, for one reason or another, they just stubbornly hold on to their office until death pries it from them, you know? And so they could be a heretic, but they're holding on to that chair in the sort of blunt physical sense of, I'm here and nobody can move me from here, right? And I'm not saying that gives them the right to rule, and that doesn't give us the duty to follow them in their errors, but it's not as easy to overthrow uh, you know, a, a, a wicked ruler, either secular or ecclesiastical, as some people seem to dream. And I think the only reason they talk this way is because their, their, their sense of Catholicism has become too much a thing in their own head. And they don't realize sufficiently that this is a social and political uh, entity, the church, and that you can't simply topple rulers by your own personal decision. This is not the way it works. It couldn't, it couldn't possibly work that way. I think, um, as I've, as I said earlier about state of occultism, people want an easy, people want to, I'm not saying the solution is easy. I'm not saying it makes your life easy. State of occultism would actually be very difficult because if you're, well, Depends if you're the unicum type. Many say days are not. They go to whatever traditional mass. They, they're personally say days and they just go to traditional masses and keep to themselves. Okay, fine. But for those who adopt the sort of extremely dogmatic state of occultism, I assume, I assume it's actually pretty difficult uh, because where are you going to go to mass? if you're, you know, It's going to be hard to find places to go to mass. Uh, but intellectually, it's a very neat and tidy, surgical, you know, we've amputated this problem. It's gone. It's like, whoa, mm -hmm. okay. I mean, that's wouldn't that be nice? Uh, but that exists that exists in and in, in there's a temptation towards that. There's a temptation to want to fix your circumstances in, when you don't have the ability. I mean, I think about um, you know uh, the young lady who uh, who assassinated Robespierre um, after the French Revolution. Uh, she thought if I just kill the head of the snake, then we're fine. It's like, well, no, we had a lot of snakes underneath him, and then they just ravished all the all the uh, Catholic types in France left and made it things even worse. Um, you know, my prime minister is Justin Trudeau. Your president's Joe Biden. If I, you know, like, first of all, I mean, the rivalry between our countries now is like, who's is worse? It's like both. But um, let's get rid of them. Okay, fine. What now? Who comes in? I mean, think about the papacy right now. Let's get rid of them. Okay, who comes in? Maybe Cardinal Seurat. Maybe he'd be okay. He'd be decent. He's obviously a pious man. He's pretty conservative. But like, is he going to be? You know the hammer of heretics and 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 the destroyer of modernism. Probably not. Is there a man who would? I don't even know if there is. I'm not trying. I'm just saying. I don't even know if that personality. I I know I couldn't do it. I don't even know if that personality even exists. So I don't even know what people's alternative is. So 
You want to get rid of Francis, then what? Who's going to be Pope? You? So it doesn't, it just, there's no easy, the, the reality is, is that we're living in a valley of tears in the mystery of iniquity. And uh, I'm not going to adopt the, the sort of Pope splainer argument that's like, suck it up and obey. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that there is an element of suck it up. The situation is hard and there's really nothing that we can do um, ex except in our, per you go on. Oh yeah, no, you were, I think you were about to say this, but I mean, what we, of course we can be interested in the theology of these questions. We, and, and we should be interested in them to the extent that we have um, leisure, education, um, you know, questions, difficulties and doubts. We should pursue these questions, but we should always remember that the primary way in which we are going to push the ball down the field, the ball of tradition, right, is by what we do in our personal lives, by participating in the mass, praying the divine office, saying the rosary, you know, gathering with like-minded Catholics and making sure that the tradition is never extinguished yeah. anywhere in the world, at least where traditional Catholics are still to be found, right? That is the way in which we will be the tools that God uses to overthrow the modernist infiltration um, in, in the higher echelons and eventually pave the way. Look, if there ever is a traditional pope, first of all, he's going to have to rise up through the ranks. Yeah. That's going to be very difficult, but God can, can perform miracles. He's going to have to rise up from somewhere. So there might be, as Michael Charlier once said, there might be some priest of an Ecclesia Day Institute right now, who is a future Pope, you know, 50 years from now, that kind of crazier things have happened than that in church history. So the traditional communities are producing the men who are going to be the priests, bishops, and popes of the decades to come. And more, moreover, if there ever is a traditional Pope, he needs to have traditional people out there, you know, who are really fully living their faith in order to be able to, I mean, if he commands the restoration of the traditional mass, or at least he allows it a la Sumorum Pontificum 2.0, you know, we all need to be ready in a moment to do everything we can to restore tradition. We have to be constantly thinking that way. Um, so in that sense, practically speaking, we shouldn't be thinking, how can we get rid of, uh, of a heretical pope? I mean, we, that shouldn't be our main preoccupation, right? Uh, it, should, it should be enough for us to know that um, we can endure this kind of crisis, that the Lord has given us the tools for doing so, that we are not ever obliged to give our assent to any teaching that comes from the Vatican that appears to us to openly conflict with what the church has always teach, teach, taught and practiced. We, we need to know that if we have that certainty, then we can endure through this crisis. All right, let's end with this. Five minutes. We might have stayed an hour at an hour and two minutes. We'll go no longer than an hour and six. Let's end with this. So I was emailing you the other day after I had read the, the book and I said, you know, I keep coming back to General Franco. Now, for those who have only read woke leftist history, you don't know who General Franco was. I know this because I did a Spanish degree and read Spanish Civil War era literature and things from the woke perspective. And then when I got out of university and read the true information, I was like, oh, I didn't learn the truth at all. Uh, he's not Saint Franco, but he wasn't Franco the devil either. Let's put it that way. So in Spain, they had this revolution and it was a Marxist. It was like all the other revolutions. Same idea. You had this man come in named General Franco, El Generalissimo. And he came in, and rightfully so, he went after the Marxists because they were Marxist. Uh, at times, he was a little bit ruthless, but one would say it would be justified in the context of where it happened because certain enemies require a certain tactic. And Spain, after that, having this sort of very strong traditional leader, had about 40 years or so of a pretty good Spain, pretty Catholic, pretty pious, pretty strong. But as soon as he died... Spain went to the gutter or started to go to the gutter. Now it's the Spain we have today, which is like the rest of Europe. How do we have a, if we, how do, how do we, if we have a general Franco Pope, meaning a guy who, who comes in and, and sort of takes things back, how do we avoid falling into this problem again? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that the general Franco example really brilliantly shows the limitations of the, the absolute centralized authority figure, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know enough about the history of, of Franco's Spain to be able to say how effective was he at trying to, in a sense, replicate his spirit everywhere so that it permeated society. Um, and, and of course, well, there are also all sorts of 
evils in modernity that are going to be luring even a traditional society away from 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 its um, its foundations. But with with the papacy, the benefit there is that he's not an absolute monarch. He's actually, you could say, a constitutional monarch who is surrounded by the College of Apostles. I mean, I'm just going to use that expression yeah. without necessarily getting it anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get, it, I get it. He's surrounded by all the successors of the apostles. And if he, if the Pope did one thing and one thing only, if he appointed good, solid, faithful, orthodox men to be bishops, and they do exist. He would just have to be like Gregory the Seventh and mm-hmm. look around for them, right? And not just take the terna of names that are that are provided through the bureaucratic process. No, he would have to institute a comprehensive search to find the orthodox, the, basically the Athanasius Schneiders of the world. Every one of them, whoever he is, would have to be uh, you know, sort of hunted down and compelled to become a bishop, right? Yep. And if, if a did nothing else except appoint only solid Catholic Orthodox bishops, traditionally minded, then the church would renew itself over the decades. I mean, that's, that's, it's actually, I don't think it's, it's more complicated than that. I mean, obviously it would be good to have some heads rolling, some excommunications of, 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 you know, modernist theologians and things of that sort. But I mean, even if you just paid attention to the bishops, that would be, that would be the, the enough. That would be huge. And I'll end, I'll end with this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, by the way, check out the link for the book in the show notes and in the chat. And also you go to Dr. K's uh, website and Substack for his pilgrimages along with mine. And if you're in England or somewhere in Europe and you want to take a quick Ryanair flight from somewhere to go to a Chesterton conference in London, England, which I know is pretty inexpensive to do. Hopefully I'll see you there June 1st, London, England. Uh, I'll end with this and say, you know, the end of the crisis in the church, my friends, seems like it's a far far away away, a long way away, but it might be closer than you think because the Novus Ordo is dying. The new springtime is a, is the nuclear winter and it's, and it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of on its last legs. I mean, I'm not saying it's gone tomorrow, but it's not producing vocations. The families that have been formed that way don't have a lot of children intentionally. So, um, the parishes are amalgamating, the schools are closing. It's all very sad. Uh, but it's also going to continue to speed up as the sort of boomer generation continues to go. That's just going to happen. And pretty soon you're going to see a lot more parity of influence between the traditionalists, traditionally minded, and the sort of institutional mainstream Catholics. And there's going to be nothing to do about it. The fulcrum is just going to switch. And the same way things went so bad so fast, uh, they can go so good so fast. You know, you don't, Mm -hmm. I always say to people, listen, look what all the bishops did during COVID uh, to change their churches and how you receive communion. That was all bad. But uh, it would not be that hard to institute the traditional mass and have it up and running in pretty much every parish on earth when, within probably 12 months, if I'm being honest, with training and things. At least, in a, maybe there'd be some transitionary ways of doing it for some older priests, but you could do it pretty fast. They can do it. So in any event, there is hope, and it's going to be run, and it's going to be sooner than I think you might imagine if you've got this long-term fatalist outlook. All right. We've done enough. I, we've talked about everything possible. Um, I think that's everything. Anything you want to add before we go? Peter? No, no. I mean, I, I suppose I'll just I'll just throw out one last comment sure. about the anthology, which is that it really does delve into these issues in quite a bit of depth with a lot of yeah. scholarship. So in a in an hour long spontaneous conversation like this, we're really kind of skating on the surface of a lot of these questions. Mm-hmm. But that's not because there isn't a lot more depth here. Yeah. It's just because we wanted to have a friendly conversation and kind of bring out what we enjoy about this book and about all the contributors to it. So yes, these, thank you for, for the opportunity, Kennedy. You're welcome. These, these Again, ladies and gentlemen, Ultramontanism and tradition go beyond the theologasting, as uh, Dr. K calls it, and get to the real heart of the matter. All right, ladies and gentlemen, check out the links in the description for if you want to become a paid subscriber on YouTube or Substack. And uh, if you want to go to Italy, check out the link for that there. And whatever else is in my show notes, I forget. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, let me know what you think in the comments. This has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless you all.